hear <laughs> your word, Eddie. Thank you, brother. Let me preface the message by a, uh, a letter I came across. I recently read it. Uh, it's of a hu that a husband reported they wrote this to his wife. She had left him and their children after a huge fight. And two days later, he wrote her this letter. My darling, two nights ago we had a huge argument. I was exhausted when I got home from work. It was 8 p.m. and all I wanted to do was to lie down and watch the game. You weren't in a very good mood. You were clearly tired after having a long day. You were trying to put the baby to sleep as the other kids were fighting. So I just turned the volume up. Would it kill you to play a more active role in your children's upbringing, you ask, turning the television volume back down? You can help out more around the house, too. Hey, I said defensively, I work hard all day just so you can play in the doll's house all day. The argument just kept going like that. I said terrible things to you that I can never take back. And you screamed saying that you were sick of it all. So you tearfully ran out of the house, leaving me to take care of the children on my own. I was forced to feed the kids and put them to bed by myself. When you didn't come back the next day, I was forced to ask my boss if I could take a day off so I could take care of the children. I experienced the crying and the tantrums. I experienced having to run around so much all day that I didn't even have a chance to shower. I experienced being forced to heat the milk, getting the kids dressed, and cleaning the kitchen all at the same time. I experienced being cooped up all day without speaking to an adult. I experienced the inability to sit calmly at the table to have a relaxed meal whenever I wanted because I had to run after the kids. I experienced feeling so physically and emotionally drained that I just wanted to sleep for 20 hours straight, but had to get up a few hours after falling asleep because the baby was crying. I live two days and two nights the way, you, the way that you do. And I think I get it now. <laughs> I get your exhaustion. I get that being a mother is all about sacrifice. I get that it is more tiring than being among corporate big wigs for 10 hours and making economic decisions. I get how frustrating you must be to have to sacrifice your job and financial freedom so that you can provide for your children. <clears throat> I get how uncertain you are about the fact that your economic security now depends on your partner and not just you. I get how hard it is not to be able to hang out with your friends, not to be able to exercise, not to be able to get a good night's sleep. I get how challenging it is being locked up and being forced to watch the children while imagining what you must be missing in the outside world. I also get that you become upset when my mother criticizes how you choose to raise our children because nobody in the world knows what is best for children like their own mother. I get that being a mother means carrying today's society's greatest burdens being the person that nobody appreciates, values, or remembers. I write this letter not just to tell you that you are missed, but additionally because I don't want to do another day without telling you that you are strong, doing an excellent job, and I admire you and I love you. Uh, oh, oh, yes, and also, Happy Mother's Day. Woo. Guys, now, do any of y'all, did any of y'all write this? Did some? <laughs> well, I must say that I would agree. I would not want to be a mother. I really would. Uh, being a father is just fantastic. Being a grandfather is even better. But I wouldn't want to be 
a mother. I read a little thing about a teacher who gave her class of second graders a lesson on the magnet and what it does. The next day in a written test, she included this question. My full name has six letters. The first one is M, and I pick up things. What am I? When the test papers were all in, the teacher was astounded to find that over 50% had written in mother <laughs> as the answer to the question. Two young children on Mother's Day presented their mom with a house plant. The oldest of the children said with a sad face, that was a bouquet we wanted to give you at the flower shop. It was really pretty, but it was too expensive. It had a ribbon on it that said, rest in peace. And we thought you would like it since you're always asking for a little peace so you can rest. <laughs> Speaking of gifts, let me ask a question. How many mothers have already gotten your Mother's Day gift today, yesterday, or today? Well, that's good. That's good. How many expect to get them sometime during the next week? Oh, yeah, okay. I knew we'd have some of those. How many expect to get them just as soon as someone remembers that it was Mother's Day? <laughs> okay. I came across this one note. I've got to share it with you. One husband wrote this to his wife on Mother's Day. M is for the mink coat you want, dear. O is for the opal ring you crave. T is for the tiny car you'd love. H is for the hat that makes you rave. E is for the earrings you'd admire, love. R is for the new rug on which you'd like to tread. Put them all together, they'd spell bankrupt. So I'm giving you this little handkerchief instead. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> well, Mother's Day. You may already know this, but let me tell you. It was a woman named Anna M. Jarvis who first suggested the national observance of an annual day honoring all mothers because she had loved her own mother so dearly. At a memorial service for her mother on May the 10th, 1908, Miss Jarvis gave a carnation, which was her mother's favorite flower, to each person who attended the service. Within the next few years, the idea of a day to honor mothers gained a lot of popularity, and Mother's Day was observed in a number of large cities. And then on May the 9th, 1914, by an act of Congress, President Woodrow Wilson proclaimed the second Sunday in May as Mother's Day. He established the day as a time, quote, for public expression of our love and reverence for the mothers of our country, unquote. So began the observance each year, second Sunday in May, Mother's Day. Motherhood, one of the highest and noblest expressions of faith known to us. What are the characteristics of a mother's faith? What is a mother's faith like? In our scripture lesson this morning, we're going to find that mothers have three kinds of faith. A sincere faith, a stable faith, and a stirring faith. I believe Timothy's mother and grandmother exemplify these attributes. So let's look at First Timothy, I'm sorry, Second Timothy, chapter one. Second Timothy chapter one. We'll be reading verses one through seven. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, in keeping with the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dear son. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears 
I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice. And I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For the spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and and self-discipline. Wow. How many times have you heard that verse? God doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but a power and love and self-discipline, or sometimes it's expressed a sound mind. That's a great verse, and it's so true. It's so real. The Bible speaks of how Paul and Barnabas visited southern Galatia on their first missionary journey in one of these cities, a city by the name of Lystra, Paul pronounced a crippled man to be healed in the name of Christ, and they nearly made sacrifices to him as a god. But then later, they drug him out in the street and stoned him, leaving him for dead. But God raised him back up and helped him recover. When Paul was in that city, that's when he met Lois and Eunice and and Timothy. That's where we find a sincere faith. Verse 5 says very plainly, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Despite all the difficulties he had, Paul left a thriving church in that city, and he made acquaintance with the older woman and her daughter, Lois and Eunice. And he was very impressed with the profound faith of these two noble women. In his second journey, Paul and Silas went back through Lystra, collected Timothy, Eunice's son, and you know what happened, don't you? From reading 1 and 2 Timothy, you can tell what happened. Timothy became one of the greatest men of God who ever carried the gospel to others. Paul claimed that this was possible because of the unfeigned faith of Timothy's mother and grandmother. Unfeigned means genuine or sincere. Timothy had a sincere faith because it came from a mother and grandmother. A mother is equipped with a sincere faith. They have this Amazing ability to rise up in the night and look after their young. An ability that escapes many fathers. And one reason is because the fathers generally are kind of slow and the mothers jump up and take care of the kids before the father gets fully awake. Now, I'm being very generous to fathers, very generous indeed, but uh, since I am one, I have to kind of defend myself a little bit, but mothers have that tremendous ability. It seems, I don't know if you've experienced this, but sometimes it seems like mothers can hear the child before it even starts, (laughs) They, they, they have this uncanny sense that the child is uneasy. And so they go to take care of it. Also, a mother never loses faith that God will watch over her household. Thank God for the sincere faith of mothers. Thank God for mothers that will pray over their household. I know that the fathers are supposed to be the spiritual leaders, but my friends, I assure you that there are probably more mothers that pray over their households than fathers. Secondly, also in verse 5, we find a stable faith. They may not come right out and say it, but there's there's a level, there's a higher level of faith 
that we find in this passage. After sincere faith, I believe there's a stable faith in mothers. mothers. Notice that since Lois was a woman of great faith, what did she do? She passed that faith on to her daughter, Eunice. If Lois's faith hadn't been stable, had been sort of wishy-washy, then she could never have brought up her daughter in the faith. And because Lois's faith was stable and <clears throat> didn't wane and flow with the tide, it stayed strong and faithful through the years long enough to impart to her daughter Eunice who imparted that faith, that stable faith to her son, Timothy. Thank God for the stable faith of mothers that can, that can last for generations. Not just for one, but for several. Finally, verse 6 talks about <clears throat> stirring faith. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Stir it up. Fan into flame. Stir it up. How many of you ever had a campfire that, or a fire in your fireplace that was going out and you took the poker and you stirred it up? And it caught back up and started to produce heat once again. Fan into flames the gift of God within you. That makes sense. That's what we need to do. It's a stirring faith. Finally, uh, as I said, the faith of Lois and Eunice was, was spawned in young Timothy. Now, not every godly mother's son becomes a preacher <laughs> or a missionary. However... Every godly mother's son will rise up and say, The faith of my mother stirs my soul. Nobody can pray like my mother can. Such a son or daughter is stirred into faith and action by his or her mother. Paul told Timothy that he was sure that Timothy's inherited faith would allow him to fan into flame the gift God had given him. That stirring is predicated, I believe, by the stirring faith of faithful mothers who down through the centuries have urged us and others on to victorious living <clears throat> by faith in Christ. As evidence of that, I can almost guarantee that whatever church you attend on any given Sunday morning, there will always be more ladies there than men. Next time you visit another church, think about that. When you walk in, look around, and you're probably going to see more women than you will men. I had a grandmother who was sort of like that to me. She was born in 1882. And she died in 1982. She lived to be 100 years, 9 months, and 22 days old. When she turned 100, she called all of her children in. She said, now I'm 100 years old. You can all brag to your friends that your mother lived to be 100. Now leave me alone and let me die. Uh, she was a very frank lady. <laughs> but you know what she told me? She said, Eddie, when I die, I want you to do my funeral. Out of all my children, 13. All my grandchildren, 38. And all my great-grandchildren, 43. You're my only preacher. And she said, I regret that. I wish more had seen the light. But you're my only preacher. And I want you to do my funeral. And I'll tell you what. For my grandmother, Vesta Cash was her name. It was an honor and a privilege and a joy to do her funeral. Because I knew what kind of woman she was. I mean, this is a lady that lived in a house with a wood stove. <laughs> it was still there when I was visiting her sometimes. A wood stove she cooked on. And... 
uh, 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 let's see, how do I delicately say this? She had a two-seater. Okay, does everybody understand? <laughs> she had a two-seater, and it was about 20 yards from the house. Sometimes on a cold morning, that was a hard trip to make, I tell you. <laughs> but, you know, that's how she was. And I remember spending weeks with her in the summer and stuff like that. It was just fantastic. But I knew she, she didn't get to go to church. I mean, she couldn't drive. She, she was in a wheelchair. She, but I knew she loved the Lord. And I knew, I knew she loved me. And it made it all worthwhile. She had 13 kids, outlived all but five. What a strong lady. What a stirring faith. Now, what can we do? What can we do to celebrate the faith of our mothers? Let me mention just four things real quick. First, model the faith of your mother. God will make the faith of a mother available to anyone. Mothers, take advantage of the faith God gives you. And pray with all the power you can muster so that you can be a good example for your children and your husband. Secondly, pray for strength for your mother. Your mother needs strength. Pray for strength for your mother. Just because God blesses mothers doesn't mean Satan doesn't attack them. On the contrary, sometimes a mother's difficulties are great. Pray for her that God will immeasurably increase his grace toward her. Third, Hold on to the promises of God for your mother. Help her to never lose sight of the fact that God made her to be someone very, very special. And he will never leave her in an hour of need. He will never let her down. Finally, do everything in your power to make her proud of you. I know that's kind of eye-opening. Make every, do everything you can to make her proud of you. I was so happy when my grandmother had that talk with me and told her that she wanted me to do her fun funeral. I hardly ever talked to a mother or a grandmother, for that matter, who does not glory in the ways and accomplishments of her children. Of all the topics you might want to discuss, I guarantee you that every mother will be happy to talk to you on this drop of a hat about her children or her grandchildren. So, thank God for mothers. It's been the sincere, stable, stirring faith of our mothers down through the years that has enabled us to become the great nation that we are today. You've heard the story. You've heard it saying, behind every great man is an even greater woman. And that's very, very true, my friends. I guarantee you, I wouldn't be up here at this pulpit today if it wasn't for that beautiful blonde-headed lady sitting right there. Because she's the one that I had already dropped out of the ministry. I dropped out of college, dropped out of the ministry, dropped out of living a pure life until I met her. And she put me on the straight and narrow. <laughs> she, she influenced, let me just, she influenced me back to good stuff. <laughs> and it worked. And we, it's been working for, come July 1st, it'll be 50 years that we've been married. It's been working the whole time. She's been working on me. God's been working on her and me, but she's been working on me too. <laughs> and it helps. It really helps. It's been that same faith in women that has brought us to this place today to worship God and to give him thanks for blessing us with godly women to nurture us in our faith. So, finally, let me just say this. Thank God for mothers. Let us pray together. Gracious God, 
Thank you for your word proclaimed, and we trust that it will not return to you without accomplishing its intended purpose. We also thank you for your church and for allowing us to be a part of it. And now as we gather around the family table to partake of the bread and the cup, we give you praise and thanksgiving for them, for this bread and this cup. In remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ. And we pray, Lord, that you would separate them from a common to a sacred use. We pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, that this bread and this cup may be for us the body and the blood of our Lord, and that we and all who have shared this feast may be one with Christ and he with us. Fill us with eternal life, that with joy we may be his faithful people till we feast with him in glory. We pray this prayer. In the name of Christ our Savior, amen.